Hello everyone, we are Saudi Duo, as you may know if you are in this video, and this is our new online project that we are calling Behind the Scores. We are going to introduce you a few composers who decided to dedicate part of their output into marimba solo and chamber music. Uh, we will analyze a few popular and not so popular uh, marimba pieces and we hope that we will give you information uh, based on our researches and of course on interviews with composers uh, that uh, will help you to interpret, to perform and to enjoy the music. The first composer that we are going to introduce you is Andrew Thomas. Andrew is a composer that if you are percussionist or you are dedicated to the marimba, you definitely must know. His piece called Maranin is definitely one of the most performed marimba solo pieces. But besides this composition, we would like to talk also about uh, his uh, other uh, music. And we chose uh, especially free transformation, which is a marimba duo. But first of all, before talking about his pieces and how we interpret them, we need to talk firstly a little bit about Andrew Thomas, both as a person and composer. Andrew Thomas is not only a composer but also a pianist and conductor. If it comes to his compositional career, he was studying in Juilliard School in New York with such personalities as Elliot Carter, or Luciano Berrio, among others, of course. Uh, nowadays, he's teaching in the same school since already 50 years. Talking now about his music and his job as a composer, the first thing that we are interested to know, at least in the moment that we are making the analysis, is the language that he is using. Surprisingly, as Andrew was telling us himself, even after growing in an atmosphere where the 12 tone music was prominent, he quite didn't find himself into that music. So, with the time, Andrew developed his own voice, as he is saying, uh, into, a tonal, into a tonal direction, yet with uh, a very more modern use of this language. He had big influence of, of, from composers uh, such as Bela Bartok, uh, Copland, and Hindemith, just for, for this fact that uh, they were writing in a very modern language, but yet keeping the tonality. The last curiosity we would like to mention about Andrew's music is like if we will analyze um, most of the titles are connecting to some poems, pictures or another art and I think it is important aspect of his music but even though the compositions have suggesting titles it doesn't always mean that they are programmatic. Well, now it's moment for talking about the pieces and we are going to start with Merlin, especially taking it from where we left it with the titles. And this is because actually there used to be a confusion with Merlin because I think I speak for, for everyone that all of us when firstly took the, this piece for playing it, we thought that this piece is programmatic Actually, the history of Merlin, it is like that, that uh, Andrew Thomas uh, wrote, wanted to write two movements for marimba. But William Morse, to whom the music was dedicated, said that he needs the title. And as Andrew Thomas uh, was reading uh, the poem those times, he noticed that the music was intuitively inspired by what he was reading those times. So this influence that we are talking about came just for the fact that mm, the poem uh, is very dark and tragic. It's talking about the destruction of the court of the King Arthur. So, and if, you, if we take a look over the musical piece, it's also very chaotic and very 
dark. As he notices the influence of the poem and changed the name of his piece, he decided to add a couple of quotes from, from the poem to his piece for helping the performer to get into the mood. Now let's take a closer look to the first movement. In the seat that Andrew Thomas mentioned in the course, uh, which is the beginning of the poem, uh, he wanted to show the incertitude and inner struggle of the personalities. If we take in account the most important changes in the music, we can divide it in three sections organized as it is shown in the image. This first movement is characterized by few musical ideas. The first one is the struggle between different sonorities like major minor or minor major, minor diminished. So we in every beginning in and end of the phrase, or better said in the majority of them, we'll find that it is starting in one sonor with one sonority and is finishing with another one or more brilliant or darker. The piece is starting with a chord of G major that is traveling to another one of G minor. So it would be logical to think that we could say that G is the central tone of the piece. Another idea is uh, using the diminished sonorities uh, not only in the vertical way, in the chords, but also in the horizontal, in the melody, by use of octatonic scales. And related to, to that aspect, because somehow it is a consequence of that use, we can find the last uh, characteristic, which is the use of the triton. Very interesting musical idea that Andrew Damas is using in the first movement of Merlin is using the phenomenon of uh, silence as a music. And it is shown in the single quarter notes which appear before the chords and which create kind of a silence leading forward the chords. Also the measures between uh, measures in, kept in silence uh, between the phrases are giving a lot of mystery and a lot of tension to the character of the piece. Now, if we take a closer look to the, to the scores, we will find that yes, it's actually using tonal harmonies, but it's not at all tonal, just for the fact that we don't find cadenza. Now, if we look closer into the score and we write down the movement of the voices, now, we will talk about the bass, we will find that actually we could find some sort of dominant tonic relationship. And it's the fact that in the climatic points in the bass we can find the D, a D note, which we could consider as dominant. Now, if we write down the rest of the voices, we will find that there is another voice that it is certainly curious also and it is the soprano voice, the upper one, and it's that it has a clear direction. It has an upper direction that uh, finishes in the, in the climax after what it goes down and it, it goes up again for the next climatic point. So we will say that both voices soprano and bass are very important. One moves a lot and has a very clear direction which is the soprano and the other one the bass has very few changes so in consequence all the changes are usually very important and especially of course the one that i mentioned before that we could argue that has some sort of do dominant relationship of course we know that it is a chorus so that we need to take care of all the voices but it is especially important when it occurs at triton interval because it creates this diminished sonority that uh, wanted to be achieved by the composer. Now that we took a, a look on the, the first movement, it is important to go already for the second one. We can mention one anecdote that Andrew said to us uh, that when he showed to William Morse 
the first movement uh, where we said that oh it's very well a uh, composition but it is quite simple so then Andrew Thomas said okay wait for the second one so now going to the second movement we can find that uh, the theta uh, that Andrew chose is uh, it's making reference to the timing and uh, in the context of the poem makes reference also about uh, the changes that are made and the chaotic that, it, that is created. Even though Marilyn II is uh, written in the total contrast to the first movement, uh, they are sharing uh, most of the principal ideas, like having the same principal tone, uh, having a lot of use of tritons and diminished sonorities. Another characteristic of, of the second movement of Merlin is especially the one that makes it in contrast with the first one, which is the rhythmic. We can find several rhythmical patterns that are repeated through all the piece. Actually, for the rhythmic, uh, and Thomas wanted to show the character and this uh, symbolism of the poem because uh, rhythmic is constantly changing and it is what makes the piece to feel chaotic. But if we take a very close look to the piece and we write down the, the notes without the changes in the rhythmic, we will find out a very very important characteristic of this piece and is the use of hidden chorals. Although there are many of them, the most representative can be found in the third page, going from bars 70 to 96. An important information is that in Berlin too, the composer decided to make a reference to the first movement, quoting a few fragments rhythmically transformed and mixed between other passages, so that the same harmonical material is gaining completely different character and meaning. For finishing talking about this second movement of the piece, we need to comment its structure. It starts opening the first bar with an introduction where the composer already introduces some of the characteristics of the piece, such as the rhythmical patterns and octagonotic scales. It continues in the bar 9 with the first section of the piece where the composer keeps using the materials from the first movement such as the diminished sonorities or already introduced autotonic scales and rhythmical patterns and, in, and introduce new, the new material such as the hidden chorals. Later we are reaching the second section of the movement in the bar 133 where with a double triton BF BF again uh, the composer creates if not the biggest one of the biggest combination of all the movement and in general the piece. Additionally, in this section, the composer starts quoting the previous movement and this will be the main characteristic of, of this part of the piece. Additionally, between quote and quote, the, the composer will keep using material that he was using in the, in the previous section. Finally, in the bar 182, we are reaching what we called the coda and where the composer himself is the is saying the beginning of the end and it's preparing for a chaotic end with uh, scales going up and down and with what i think is very symbolic final chord created by the triton bf which we already saw before in the re in the left hand and g the notes g and d and the right hand who are the tonic and dominant, which this chord for me is quite symbolic because it holds in the same uh, chord the big consonants and the struggle. An important and interesting information for all the players could be that the scores contain serratas. Uh, by making deep research we found few of them so if you are interested about the concrete, please uh, write us in the comments. Finally, 
For finishing this video, we would like to thank, of course, Andrew Thomas for his time and dedication, and of course, also to Marimba Festival for their support with the Corona petition. Uh, we hope we gave you useful information. If you are curious about some more specific aspects uh, of what we were talking about, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we, you can find us on our website, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, stay tuned for next of our videos. Thank you very much. Bye.